I mean, look at us. We're like a six-headed advert for university right here. All right, JP's the name. Learning, drinking and shagging's the game. Hello? I was, uh, um... <laughs> Sorry, you knew a student house would come with its very own glory hole. What's a glory hole? Oh, it's nothing. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. Fry it up. Meet a bix. We're very Hufflepuff here. Wouldn't you be happier in Slytherin? I'm not a fucking witch, Kingsley. Uh, Katie missed it. I am now no longer a virgin. Let's go out and get totally fucked. Right. You said if you want to shag a tutor, you should shag a tutor. If he's a middle-aged dick splash with a shriveled bell end, think on. For fuck's sake. It's really funny. Let me fuck you up. Do you want to see it? That is insane. I don't give a fuck. Classic Hartnell night out. Come down if you want. Oh, cool. Can you get us three drinks? Um, can Bob the Builder fix it? Yes. Famously, he can. I'm fucking blind. Hello. The future... Yeah! ...starts now. I mean, how are you both feeling that we're here tonight, 10 years on, with an audience of people who feel so touched by this show still? And as is visibly clear from the cast that are here as well, that was a very formative, um, loving experience for them as well. What's going through your minds? Well, it's just very honouring, you know, and it's the cast and are the loveliest group, and we all are like, like each other after 10 years, which is pretty, pretty amazing. So, yeah, it's, a, it's pretty great to be here, actually. I'm also quite tired because I got off a plane in LA today. So I'll be keeping myself caffeinated throughout. I think we can keep you going. Now, this idea first came to you both from what I understand in the late 90s when you were both studying at Manchester Uni yourselves. What was it about that experience and your personal journeys that felt so necessary to, to kind of translate into this show? Or is it the, the first seed for this show? Well, I mean, we shared a house. At, at uni and Manchester was obviously where the show was set so we went and it felt like a really interesting melting pot that particular city for being a student in all the different backgrounds Jesse and I from quite different backgrounds which really adds to the whole point of the show I think that people are having this very intense experience and mixing in ways that you don't normally get to do in, in Britain and you know living together was was a good basis for drawing on we shared lots for our shared house. I ended up sharing basically one room with a dividing wall, a bit like Josie and Kingsley, <laughs> the glory hole. <laughs> you know. So we kind of drew on archetypes, people we knew, and also our own experience. I'm probably a bit of an Oregon deep down. <laughs> so, you know, it was, a, it was a mix, but it felt like a great sort of subject. And we did, as you say, we wrote it before Peep Show, and we're about five years out of uni, so it felt pretty fresh at the time. And I mean, you've mentioned Oregon. I think something I love about the show is that we all see a little bit of ourselves in at least some, if not all, of the characters. How did you come about bringing these, these six very different but very loving kind of community of characters to the screen? Where did that initial kind of inspiration come from? Yeah, as Sam said, I guess it was a show we came up with shortly after un university. Um, I think it was a kind of pity commission from the BBC <laughs> when we, they failed to go ahead with something else that we were doing with them and it, it languished in a desk for like 10 years so anybody who's a writer or creative and feels like that idea is dead um, once it gets rejected things can spring back to life um, and yeah we, I guess we, when we were thinking about the sorts of people who should be in this house they changed they changed a bit as we as we uh, develop developed the show but just as you said I think we we drew a bit on people we'd met and hopefully archetypes and individuals, but then messed it all up. <laughs> I think everyone sort of knew a Howard at uni or some oddball. There was like an urban myth at Manchester that there was some student who spent his whole student loan on cooking a whole flapjack and keeping it in the air and cupboard to feed himself. <laughs> I doubt that ever happened, but it was kind of like where we started with Howard. And I think there are a lot of JPs at Manchester, right? There's a lot of JPs out there, aren't there? <laughs> or certainly you hear them more than the others. 
And, and, and once we got into the writers' room, because we wrote the pilot together, but it was a, un, unusually then it was a team written show in the UK, and we found talking to the, a fellow writers right that everyone kind of everyone knew a Howard. Um, and everyone had a bunch of Howard stories, um, uh, and, and the same went for <laughs> other people. The Howard stories were usually just a bit more memorable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they're a project of the traits, absolutely, but then they are just so much more. And so I put together a feature on Fresh Meat last year when we realised it was the 10th anniversary, and I spoke to you, Sam, and something that you said that struck me was that um, these people do terrible, terrible things in the show, but you still very much stay with them and love them. What was the key to doing that? What was the key to making you want to stick with them even when they did, you know, do just some downright terrible things? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think one of the things which we didn't, I didn't particularly realise until we shot this first pilot was because the characters are quite young, you sort of forgive them more. They sort of have an innocence about them, which helps. Also, casting really likeable, talented actors which we managed to do really helps, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's a sad little whoop. I mean, Kimberly Nixon, you know, drove a drill through someone's face and still became likable. Broke Sophie Wu's arm in a martial arts class and still remained likable somehow. <laughs> and with you know a character like JP, who is sort of the most despicable in some ways, we just kept making him suffer. <laughs> you know, breaking his heart, killing his dad, it all kind of, <laughs> I think it helps if you, if you know that someone has, you know, a bit more to them than just their annoying front, so it's a bit of both really. Yeah. Um, Joe mentioned when I spoke to him that there was a Fresh Meat Bible, and on the front of the Bible it said that this is a show about people who pretend to be one thing, but really they're not. Do you remember, do you remember that, do you remember what that, what was at the heart of that? I don't remember that. <laughs> I, I think Joe might be clever. Time ago. I think you might have written a better Bible than we had, Joe. <laughs> Sounds very I'm clever, whatever you write. <laughs> we certainly did have. We had some things like that in the writers' room uh, that we thought, and I think that was, you know, it, it, that age is a going to university is a great time for a bit of reinvention and presenting yourself as one thing and being another is. It, a great thing for, for to write towards, because um, I guess it can be a bit of life anyway, but it's exaggerated, right? As you meet this whole new group of people, I remember that vividly from the pilot of Nutsford and all that 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 that, that stuff, which yeah. was um, so enjoyable to pick away the layers. I want to ask if there over those four seasons there was uh, a storyline that you were especially proud of, or one that's really stayed with you since the show wrapped. A bit too British to answer that question enthusiastically. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel like, in general, you know, I'm I'm proud that we made a show with like three f funny women in the leads. I mean, that means a lot to me. I've sort of written some more, you know, female-fronted movies, and I think that since then, I think that that gave me the confidence. I think as younger writers, we might not have had the confidence to say we can write across the gender divide and that I'm proud of and yeah I mean there's a lot I'm proud of really. Yeah I mean uh, for some reason when I was just watching those clips I thought oh all you can eat it was that <laughs> all you can eat scene that was funny and, and, and a lot of our, I found we, we Sam and I were really busy during the time the show we, we also uh, wrote, wrote Peep Show and so oftentimes we weren't there um, having fun with as you're going to see with all the all, all, all the cast but we did have a great time in the writers' room. The writers' room was incredibly productive, incredibly fun, incredibly lovely group of people, lots of whom are here. Um, so I think that's what I think about when I think about, about the show personally. Yeah. And were these six people, the, the six people that you started off with, the six characters, did they go through many iterations? Were they big? Well, you certainly start, once we cast this brilliant cast, and that's the other thing which felt like yeah, uh, and, and why we're all really pleased to be here because we all still like each other, and it's such a they're such a lovely group. I, I, I think those archetypes were there. I don't think any you could see. It, you'd be interested to see if the cast feel that they changed a lot from the pilot. But I think we started writing towards the stuff that they could do, which is almost anything. But in there, you know, it felt exciting to to follow that, right, Sam? Yeah. I have to ask about the house, which feels like. It's a, I know it's such a cliche to say, but felt like a character in itself because it felt so incredibly 
lived in? Were you over the kind of creation of that in any way? Did you have any input from your own experiences as to what this slightly rancid but, but very loved house share looked like? I mean, I can't, I don't think I can take, we can take too much credit for Tom Sayers' brilliant design because it did look so livable and it was completely a set. I'm still amazed that there was a fake basement on the ground floor. That's just, I'm just naive and easily impressed with stuff like that. <laughs> but no, it, yeah, I think you're right. The house was a character. Uh, I guess things like the glory hole were our ideas, but on the whole, it was just like a brilliant team of... of it was of a great crew. set and beautifully shot. Dave Kerr shot the pilot, right? And yeah. and, and so, yeah, it was... It, 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 in TV shows, there's always a temptation to, you know, turn it into the friend's flat and give yourself more space for the cameras, more room to do interesting shots. And I think it was a usable set, but it also felt like one of the, felt like a, you know, a 19th century student house, so um, built in the 19th century. <laughs> I'm a little bit cool for asking this because there are some of the supporting cast out here, but who um, was a, a character outside of the core cast that you really enjoyed writing or helping to develop? Definitely going to be Sabine and Professor Shales. <laughs> I'm here this evening. It was, that was a very... Um... <laughs> the others who, who couldn't be bothered to fly. <laughs> I mean... You know, Yelka flew from Amsterdam just to be here, so, and almost had to, to drop into the ocean, I think, because of the fog, so, good, you know, that means a lot. But they're two great characters to write. Tony and Yelka are amazing actors. I was very fond of Sophie Wu's Heather. We had Gemma Chan, some amazing actors in the show. Um, Robert Webb. I mean, it's, we were very blessed, weren't we? Great supporting cast. Do you find now... Looking back, do you feel differently about some of the characters? Or has your relationship with some of the characters changed than when you first started to create them? I think they kind of take on a life of their own to a certain extent. Like, I think we're going to see the final scene of the series a bit later, which is Josie walking around the house on her own. And, you know, that's not, it wasn't obvious to us that that would be the way the show would end when we started writing it. But it felt like, you know, she sort of, in a way became the conscience of the house and that sort of thing just evolves organically in the show so you know it's lovely when you have that relationship with the characters and also we'd we'd, we'd always written well pretty much i think this is true we'd written basically half hour sitcoms until this point and as sam says very male ones the old guys and peep show mainly peep show and this show i think with judy cunahan's help and the help of objective they got us a, a slot that was 45 minutes and that's unusual in all, all tv it certainly was then and it meant that the the tone of the show is different it's not you know that's hopefully we always it was always a comedy and we were always looking for the next joke but i think it, you know not all show not every show would get so many folk coming you know 10 years after it started and i think it's Hopefully it was funny, but also that emotional engagement. We we definitely felt you wouldn't you couldn't write that scene and hope for it to work um, for a final scene of many shows. But I think yeah, people got a, built up a relationship with those characters that was meaningful. I think so, and I mean you've both gone on to do such extraordinary things since, of course, and and across such a range as well. But I wonder now with this time between that first episode coming out and, and where we are now. I mean, how are you reflecting on that time? And what did that time mean to you working on this show? Well, I think, as Jesse said, it was a really interesting evolution in our writing relationship because we'd co-written for like 10, 15 years before that. But we kind of expanded our writing partnership into a writing team, which was quite a big step, but a very enjoyable, successful one. Yeah, it just felt like you know, we were growing and, you know, it's, it's very, um, you know, precious to me that it worked out as well as it did because, you know, you never know when you start a new show. So I'm still kind of pinching myself that we're here 10 years later still talking about it. Are you, are you surprised that you've come back and that these people have, we've got this I'm just surprised that anything works when you make it up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like such a gamble. So, yeah, I'm, it's really, you know, it's worth not taking for granted for sure. And how about you, Jesse? Yeah, most shows don't work. Most things, most creative endeavours don't work. And so when you get like an idea and then an amazing cast like this and it works, it, you know, you you can't imagine changing any element of it because it feels so. That's how it was meant to be. It's yeah, it's a pretty special thing. And yeah, I haven't watched the show back much, but just seeing those clips, yeah, I'm just very 
fond of it and proud of to be involved with that body of work. It's good, you'd like it. You think I'd like it? Right in the street. Yeah. Well, I think Zowie's reaction there probably answered my first question, but how, again, how are you feeling to be here? Hell, this is amazing! <laughs> this is absolutely amazing! Thank you, everyone, for coming! It's, it's <laughs> fucking time! Can I just say, Zowie was really... She was, we got here and she was like... <gasps> What if no one's bought a ticket and it's yeah. really patchy out there? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it'll be patchy at best. You know? <laughs> we'll, we'll focus in on the small group in the middle of the auditorium. <laughs> but thank you for coming and thank you all of our c collaborators, creators, directors, um, uh, colleagues for coming tonight and, and probably loads of people that we haven't seen yet. But And, and Beth for organising this. We had no idea people would be interested after 10 years. Um, <laughs> and uh, it means a lot, really. Thank you. No, I'm thrilled. I'm just thrilled that we can make this work. And you're all here, given just the stratosphere you've all gone into since this. But I want to start with First Meets. And because <laughs> you, you auditioned at different times. I feel like everyone's audition process was a little bit different. Um, but you came together for this big table read ahead of <laughs> the big summer in Manchester. Um, what were your first impressions of each other when you were sat down together for the first time? I want to open with Charlotte because Charlotte hadn't been cast yet. No. <laughs> that was so fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I was still in the balance. And um, I think it was a bit of a sort of, ah, we'll see, we'll see. And um, yeah, I was nervous. I don't remember any of it. I just, honestly, I was so nervous. Um, but I remember the read through bit just being just like, I'm really so I can't I, honestly all I thought was don't fuck this up like I can't think of anything specific that happened and then I, I sort of wandered around Manchester for about three hours and then got the call being like you're in and I was like oh, oh my god <laughs> but I think by that point I was so invested I think having met everybody and seeing it come together and having read the scripts that many times like my fourth I think it was my fourth audition and. Having read it, I just was like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to hurt really badly if I don't get this. Um, so, yeah, it was the best, the best possible news ever. Uh, yeah. What did you guys feel? <laughs> did, I can't remember. Did we just say, after, after we learned that you hadn't been cast, did we just say, well, have a good day? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, <laughs> you, you were just like, well... Oh, it was like, really <laughs> awkward. It was yeah, really... Because we didn't was, know was. before... So. We did the read through, just thinking, oh, you're, you're, you're are again. Mm -hmm. And then after you're like, yeah, I haven't got the job yet. And <laughs> we're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We Sam and Jesse were behind lunch? your back doing that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> read as well. Every time awesome. I yeah. just <laughs> delivered it bad, it's like, <laughs> I don't know. It, was, yeah. also, it, was, it well, was a rigorous casting process. And, uh -huh. and that is a, a, a testament to um, the team that made it because it was, it was supposed to be rigorous because they wanted it to be really good yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and so I know that I had auditioned in my uh, I think six auditions uh, with a couple of other Oregons mm. so when we turned up to the read through and Charlotte was there I was like oh what's the new one because I had one <laughs> 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 I had with her and um, I don't think any of us had necessarily been I originally read up. for Oregon <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, it's very massive good. mistake. What were they thinking? I remember it being really significant. I think how we got on. Yeah. I remember that very clearly. Us in the car together after it had been confirmed and being yeah. like, "This is the person that we, that's the relationship that's like really going to be really close." You know, because it was in the. That's so it was true. So set up. Yeah, that was so yeah. true. I, I think everyone ha everyone met their uh, matches on that day, yeah, yeah. and you could see the triangles or the duos that were going to basically sustain us for you know four seasons yeah, yeah well and i i auditioned about seven times <laughs> uh but mainly for oregon and it was only the line i know it was sam was it you sam who said ask her to read for josie yeah, instead I think it might have been, yeah yeah it was yeah <laughs> um and but i remember seeing joe at one of because they did a thing it's like halfway through the the audition process they did this thing where they kind of get in like three Josies and three Oregons and three and then they do a mix match of you to like see who you know and I remember Joe came in to do a read of Kingsley but like a day before I'd gone to an audition for his sitcom 
which I didn't get. <laughs> yeah, I where he I, was auditioning me, and then suddenly. <laughs> there, no, 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 no. She would have interfered. She would have interfered. I'm really fucked off about it actually because I, I fought for that. <laughs> and then like it was great. Witch. So I did this audition. I didn't get it. And then two days later, we oh, were like, we Simon were like Bush. on an even. Ke- we were both auditioning. I was like, fuck you. <laughs> and I was like, this is Josie and Kingsley. This is their dynamic. This is brilliant. And fuck yeah. you, Joe. <laughs> So we really, we really get on after 10 years. Really on. No, it's nice. I remember being quite scared to take the part as well because for the like previous three years I've been doing stand-up, I've been very conscious that I, you know, I was, I, I basically did an act where I, I would change my voice and I would go on stage and I would talk a little bit like Danny Dyer because I didn't want anyone to know that I went to public school. <laughs> And I read the part and I read the script, I was like, it's, the writing is amazing, but this character is such a twat. <laughs> and I said to my agent, I said, I, I, I'd, I love the idea of doing it, but I'm just worried that if I do this, people will think that I'm a posh twat. <laughs> and thank God she said to me, Jack, I think the cat is already out of the bag. <laughs> 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 now everyone knows. I mean, I did want to ask about transformations because some of them were quite vigorous. And Greg, I know that you especially had to adopt a whole new physicality for Howard. Could you tell me about what the kind of the in was for your character? Well, I... <laughs> he's not oh, even no, Scottish. No. <laughs> oh, you're so JP. Um... <laughs> <laughs> in, in terms of transformation, I mean, you, you get a script, and the script's phenomenal, and uh, you read it, and you think, well, who, who is this guy, and, and what, does he, what does he like, and what he doesn't like, but the, the clarity of the script makes that transformation, if you want to say that, uh, so much easier to do, but of course, I'd, like Sam and Jesse are talking about influences of being a student and having grown up around people, and I've always enjoyed taking bits from people I've met, and um, there was a producer I worked with um, prior to Fresh Meat in... Scotland, who every time you'd suggest something to him, he'd go, that's a great idea. (laughs) (laughs) And he'd, and he'd, oh, that's absolutely true. And and he nods. And I just remember thinking as Howard was going through his his own internal madness that that he'd become even more sure of himself if he just went, classic. And so it is like when you meet people and you take stuff, but in order for that to have any meaning, you need to have a script that allows that. Yeah. And there was another guy I was at drama school with who wore hiking boots to, uh, to drama school, and he walked at a pace that you could not keep up with. Right? <laughs> Which I always find funny, because it wasn't trainers that you can keep up with him, it was the walking boots. And he had this absolute peace and heaviness to him. And so you read the script and you think, right, well, what would work? Howard's, Howard's incredibly confident in the house, and outside he's a bit of a shell socially, he doesn't really want to do stuff. So certain things then start in your mind going, well, he might walk with a heaviness and a confidence. And the, um, when he's out and about to try and hide, you know, you're talking about hiding and being a different person at university and becoming, or trying to become someone else because you're so scared. Um, and so the, the, it's, it's not really a transformation, it's just using what you have in the script, which is brilliant, and then drawing on some unfortunate, um, <laughs> unfortunate ticks from other people. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. but I mean, it's a total joy to get to when the writers are writing for you and, and they start to, to maybe pick up on those things. As, and they said, and I have to reiterate, you know, Sam and Jesse created the show and wrote the show, but the team of writers we had, mm-hmm. cannot say this enough, it was like uh, unbelievable scripts that we got through yeah. uh, kind of Universal Four series of team written work, which is kind of unbelievable, really. Yeah. And Greg suffered for his art because we used to film in the summer in the house, which was in a warehouse, and he was just in wool. (laughs) In wool and big boots, and it was like... Yeah, it didn't have a metal roof. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) It was literally like, yeah. And obviously, because for filming and stuff, you can't have, like, air con going... (laughs) So uh, it um, it was just dabbing... Dabbing. It was, but it kind of added to a lot of Howard's panic. Yeah. <laughs> and his readiness. Yeah, his readiness. But yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was a joy to get to, to explore that. But. Red trousers are also quite thick. <laughs> <laughs> Surely there's a bit of air out of those boat shoes. That you have. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Those boat shoes. 
I mean, Sawi, you as well. Now, I understand the, the head shave was part of the, the journey into Vod. Well, what else did you do to kind of assume the role of hair? Yeah, the head shave was a surprise. I, um, <laughs> I, it's, it's worth um, picking up on the, on the casting process question and saying that some of us were cast quite last minute. And yeah. I think just after Charlotte, I think I was cast the most last minute, not because of any disorganisation, but because of this pairing and Getting matchmaking right. yeah. that had been going on. So I got the call, I think, on the Friday and I moved to Manchester on the Sunday night. Yeah, it was the um, yeah. and, uh, and so I, I arrived, and um, our incredible uh, hair and makeup team and our uh, costume team were the first people that we met, and um, Janet Horsfield and June Nevin. I don't know if they're here tonight, are they here? No, no don't like us, <laughs> fine. Uh, um, were instrumental in igniting that yeah. process mm. and so I had obviously created something in the auditions that I kind of wasn't necessarily cognitively aware of you know you go into those auditions and you're reading these brilliant lines and you're doing silly voices the like of which I was doing no one else was doing I was doing a silly voice and um, <laughs> I'm going is that going to work is that what they still want me to do when I arrive maybe they'll want to <laughs> change what I've done mm -hmm. and you arrive and you meet your design team and they tell you what you know what the creative uh people what the creative grown-ups want to kind of set in concrete and they said look you've created something that feels very punk and they want to run with that and i had a really lovely um blonde bob that I'd got in on my first trip to New York very recently uh, and I was like oh okay well this will work then like this blonde bob like it's kind of punk so it's kind of blonde but also like please don't tell me to take away this hair that I've just got I'm very lots of money get it and they were like uh well we think we might go more towards the uh riot girl kind of shaved head <laughs> um and they gave you loads of champagne, didn't they? Look, this is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, met, I was with you. I think I was with you. You were with me. I told you to go. <laughs> yeah. oh, God. So basically, you have, well, you know, this was the brilliant thing about also being young when you're creating characters that are young because your mm. rhythms mm. are like, fuck it, you know. And so I was like, <laughs> one glass of champagne, and there were the sound of clippers in my ear. <laughs> um, and, I had, and I had a shaved head. But what was great was, I think all of us um, can agree, was reading in the script uh, um, an undeniable 90s-ness. <laughs> it, it felt like a pre-internet script, really, that we were reading. And that was so refreshing because you felt like you could summon these very nostalgic references and have them be understood mm. and have them uh, build the fabric of the, of the show. Because we weren't skins, you know? We weren't having threesomes in the hot tub. Not on screen, come on. <laughs> 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 Joking, no! No! <laughs> But we weren't supposed to be cool. Yeah. And so I, I think like everyone else went, look, these are the bands from the 90s that I like. Mm. You know, I'm into, I was into grunge when I was a student and I was into um, Bowie and, uh, and, and they kind of just collected our nostalgic mm. references together and created who we were. Um, and I think if we'd been a year or two out from that point, it could have, it could have been very different. Yeah. But the only note I got from the costume department was, Jack, can you bring in some of your own clothes? <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> All these stories, you guys put in so much more work than I did. <laughs> to get into character, literally all I did was that with my collar. <laughs> Method for 33 years. <laughs> I always remember at the British Comedy Awards when we won an award, but the evening was slightly tainted by Jonathan Ross, who said that as an actor, I had the range of a North Korean missile. <laughs> it's not true, Jack. Come on. Come on. Can, well, can I, I just say something quickly yeah. about David's here, and, and uh, I think it's worth kind of tying into the the 45 minute and uh, Roberto at Channel Four and Judy and Rhonda was that. When, the, when you have a little bit longer to work on things, uh, perhaps, although the day was very, very busy, but it's a 45-minute 
show, and it was kind of funded partly out of uh, drama budget, if I'm uh, correct, is that the technical element to shooting this was quite interesting. Yeah. So if you come from sitcom, which is half hour, not lots of money, we need to absolutely batter through this, mm. was that I learned a lot from Fresh Meat, a huge amount from just a slightly different approach technically. So it became, mm. some of the shoot was yeah, quite- the shots were a lot different. Like you're kind yeah. of half hour sitcom, it's basically like, a wide at the beginning and then yeah. just bosh 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 all on the faces mm. like in, in between us we knew we didn't have to learn our lines because <laughs> it's a bit annoying actually coming onto this <laughs> I remember like, you want two in a row <laughs> <laughs> cut away cut away that's the system <laughs> one of me then cut away <laughs> You're right, but, but yeah, the, the, the sitcom thing is basically like a wide at the beginning, you see like where they are, and then it's like all singles, yeah. like on him, on him, back to like, and um, there was there was like sort of artistry in this. And yeah. Like, yeah, and, just, uh, yeah, yeah, a bit more discipline, know. maybe. Yeah, there was that, more discipline. But... Wow. Um, <laughs> no, but in terms of how the, the look of the show, oh, no, we created a show that looked... Was, it was a different approach from just doing, well, hit the gags, hit the gags. Yeah. We had it to hit the gags and yeah. we had to get the chemistry, but we created a show, and again, through Tom's design and Janet and June and the whole team behind and it. And the DOPs and the way that they, the, the way that they, it was, because I'd come from much more, this is my first comedy ever. So I'd come from a lot of dr drama, especially period dramas. And, it, you know, there's long setups where you rehearse um, and I know now with like a sitcom, you rehearse, you block it, you, you know, and then within half an hour, you start shooting it quickly. Whereas sometimes we'd have like an hour and a half mm -hmm. because of how, how beautifully they were lighting it. Um, and, yeah. you know, and the time that was taken and with the, I know like Lambie and uh, the, uh, the art department were just, with any little detail, it was just detail, detail, detail yeah. all the time, um, <coughs> which you don't get because in TV, everything's mm. fast. Just we need to bosh, 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 bosh. So, um, yeah, so that, th I've never had that really. Never, yeah. It's with, like the crown, this. but with more glory holes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. I always say. It's quite a glory holes in the but crown. It's yeah. it, <laughs> it is worth saying that, that it was so many of the creatives that helped to create each one of these characters, yeah. because yeah. I certainly know that first, couple of weeks when we were shooting like you Kim I was like I'm from a drama background I have no idea what how to make a joke work necessarily and um, I, I, and I don't really know what to do in the bits in between the lines because mm -hmm. Sam and Jesse and our writing team are great at writing stage directions but they also very kindly gave us a lot of freedom when it came to creating the atmosphere of that house so we kind of ended up especially decided, when six of us were in a scene yeah absolutely who was making a tea who was sitting down who was yeah. reading who, who was, was like smoking no, but like <laughs> <laughs> uh, but art, well, department, was eating? Eating? Like, yeah, yeah. art department was so incredible that you'd like do a little rehearsal and then if it was a kind of a big scene with six of us where i wasn't particularly doing much in it apart from just sort of listening and yeah. um i'd just be like oh, i think she'd be doing some weird with wool or um, or maybe she's got some like playing card, and they were just there. They yeah. were just like, leave it with me. And then five minutes later, you'd have this incredible, really like idiosyncratic prop. Yeah. It was. Yeah. They were just so on it. Incredible visually. I mean, yeah. Like, yeah. The, the 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 quality of the the art department and like, the props and all of that was. Yeah. And all our bedrooms. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so that was a big Amazing. moment actually. Oh, so when you were when you were shown your bedroom yeah. was the moment yes. that your character kind of dropped into your yeah. being yeah. because uh, it was just so real. Yeah, it, it was. We were kind of in a set that was a house, and it yeah. was. It was the best shoot ever as well because you could do a ten-hour day and you could nip off for a nap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were made up. Yeah. But like, where's Jack? I was like, was sleeping in my room yeah. in a bed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The lights off. Incredible. Yeah, <laughs> that episode where I had the mumps was the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> well, we're going to go to a clip that I think not only like bottles all of what you've just said, but is one of my favourite clips in the show. We're going to go to the Chinese buffet. Oh, oh God! God. Great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I guess since we're here, we may as well eat all we can. No. First, we talk tactics. Number one. Positioning close to the buffet, minimising plate travel time 
and ensuring prime position for refills. Number two, the first round. Just one of each item. We are nothing to worry about. We are not gluttons. This is the introductory taster plate. We don't want to use stomach space on non-tasty items. <laughs> Three. When returning to the station for round two, maximise high-value items, e.g. prawns, over lower-value bulk food such as rice or noodle. Remember, the aim here is not simply to have a satisfying meal out. The ultimate aim is to beat the buffet. There's such a fine line between maniac and genius, isn't there? And finally, four. When you think you can't eat any more... I'm not filling my cheeks like a hamster, nor am I hiding spring rolls up your jacksey. Bring out the transporter. What? on a Sunday <laughs> <laughs> in Manchester, I remember yeah. it very well. And I'll be the one to kick off the admissions of how hungover we were during one scene <laughs> or another. I was so hungover that day. It were couldn't you? have been better. It was like Chinese, <laughs> Chinese buffet at like 6 a.m. I was like, it's heaven. I mean, I, I need to ask about that first summer because it was, it feels like it was a formative one for all of you. So you, will, you moved up together. Not only did you move up together, you were living together, you were shooting together. And Kimberly, I remember you telling me in our interview that you became quite obsessed with each other in that first I, so I didn't say obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite obsessed. Yeah. 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 I just wanted to be with them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and smell them. And, you know, it was... It, it really, it was kind of like, you know, those like halcyon days. It was like this really, like, I don't, there's something about the summer in Manchester that the, the, the sunlight just lasts into the evening. And so we just had ridiculous, you know, we'd be with each other from like half six in the morning until, you know, half three in the morning. <laughs> but we, we just weirdly, we were, I think this is where David and, and all the casting and the producer and everything s just saw something. Because we're six people who ha have nothing in common. <laughs> As you say, we shouldn't yeah, be friends. We should yeah. not be friends. We, we make no sense on paper. <laughs> but there's, there was something, I don't know, there was just something that we all brought. And, th and it just, I don't know, completed this sort of rectangle of joy. And um, yeah, and we just we just went out a lot because <laughs> Manchester was just so great. And also, I went to drama school, so I didn't have that uni experience of like, you know, th three lectures a week or whatever. Like drama school's like eight in the morning till seven at night every day, like for three. You know what I mean? It was it, it gets you ready for the business. So fresh meat was my uni. <laughs> like it really, really was. It was um, it was just a really, really special time. And then we were really lucky to get to do three more summers. Yeah. My uni was Manchester, which meant when we were filming it that first year, I'd been there four years before as a student. <laughs> so we'd go into all these venues and I'd have these horrific flashbacks. <laughs> Me we'd, too. We'd be Me doing too. a scene yeah. and I'd be like, fuck, the last time I was in this bar, I think I did poppers and then chundered in a bin. <laughs> It would happen all the time, wouldn't it? I, be in the I re I rewatched some in in the week, uh, you know, to, to get ready for this. And we, there's a scene in the student union, and I remember yeah. stealing a plant from the student <laughs> union on a night out when I was a student in Manchester. I was like, that corner, there's a memory attached to this. <laughs> Me stealing a houseplant. Uh, well, I think I think it would have been very different if we'd shot this in London, for instance, if yeah. everyone had gone yeah. home at the end of the yeah. day. I think yeah. there's a definite. Um, you know, we built relationships by us all being in the same place geographically. So going out in the evenings, I think, fed into... Luckily, we all got on well. I mean, that can go two ways. It can <laughs> yeah. explode in the, in the opposite direction, but yeah. it turned out that we it's, liked it's hanging out. It's amazing that that was the case. Like, yeah, I yeah. just... Even by the fourth series, just the idea that we'd spend that, that long together from eight in the morning till seven filming. Mm. And then it'd be like, 
half seven at the trough, great, okay. Yeah. And then we'd be yeah. there till like eleven, and it was just. But that's like, the only reason we wanted to do more series. Like it was yeah. just like <laughs> oh, that. Yeah. Oh, the six of us will definitely be together for like three and a half months. Cool. Oh, we'll, and we'll make the show. Yeah, that'll be great. That'll be brilliant. That'll be, I mean, yeah. that's basically why we wanted to do this. It's also really hard when you're playing students and so many of the scenes, it's like written into the stage directions. The six of them are sat around a table, they're horrendously hungover. <laughs> and you look at your call sheet for the following day and it's the evening yeah, it's and you're there and you're yeah. at a bar and you're like, it's what Daniel Day-Lewis would do right now. <laughs> and we were very method for that first scene. Yeah, yeah. We took it seriously. We were also we lucky that myself and Jack are both summer babies and so we had like birthdays almost. Yeah immediately uh, oh. in our in our shooting schedule and that was a real icebreaker and mm. a real lubricant and um <laughs> <laughs> my god right. and joe thomas is a great dancer i don't know if you know that really is a pussy man no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Joe, you okay? You okay, Joe? I didn't hear that, but that's... <laughs> I, I found it surreal also because I, I hadn't quite finished uni when I started it. Yeah. I had, like, three more weeks left. So it really was, like, coming out of one thing straight into another. And what I find so difficult to process is that... I, it's because it's ten years ago, famously. Um, I really was so much more actually Oregon than I appreciate now. I think I said this to you. Like, I, I can't believe, I, I, it's just, it's bizarre <laughs> looking back at it. I, I really had just come from uni and I really had been pretending and I was pretending so much. And actually, like we were saying, just credit to Janet Horsfield and June Nevin for the costume and stuff because even then I don't think I quite understood some of the costumes were like, exactly, that's what Oregon would wear. <laughs> and like, I, it just this whole, the whole kind of amalgamation, but the strangeness of coming from that environment and then having that like turbocharged because we really did live like students when we weren't filming. It was so surreal. Yeah. And it also brought with it kind of new challenges as performers. And I, I'm going to have to disagree with Jonathan Ross here because there were some scenes of really <coughs> bare vulnerability in this comedy, which at the time, 10 years ago, I don't think was seen as much. So we're going to play now. So it's, it's later on in season one, and both Oregon and JP are coming to terms with the fact that they're, they're about to experience some really, I'm sorry, it's not very funny, but the they're about to experience the some really intense loss. We've got two scenes from that episode that will sort of show just how groundbreaking the show was in terms of, of blending those two and the capability of what these young actors could do as well. What's wrong? Hey, no, I, all good. Just, you know, just sit down. Seeing all these old people is really tiring. You know, I get, I get like that sometimes, like art galleries, all the old paintings, they're tiring. What's going on? My dad's had a heart attack. I've, I've kind of been going through some tough home shit as well. Yeah. It's just, um, I've had this horse, roulette. Um, I've had him since I was 12, and I think we're going to have to put him down, like, soon, and... A, a horse? That's not the same. What? A horse and a dad, that's not the same. No, oh no, I wasn't saying that... Seriously, not cool, Oregon. It's a horse. It's basically just a big fucking dog. I know that it's just... I know that it's just basically, factually, just a horse, but... It's like... Roulette was my whole childhood. And I feel like my whole childhood is about to be shot in the head. Yeah, well... I guess that's pretty shit. Thanks. Hey, I kind of love the fact that you got a horse, though. You're one of me. What? No, I mean, I'm not. I'm not really. Um, you know, we had him on loan for the first few years, and uh, th then we bought him really cheap, and his tax always second-hand. I don't even wear proper boots. I just wear trainers and fuck up my feet. Ooh, edgy. Grunge horse. Gotcha. Big Porsche. We've never talked, have we? Because you're a horse and I'm a stranger. But 
We can still be close. We can still have a connection. You're not boring. Just because you're a horse doesn't mean that you're boring. <laughs> I really want a hug. <laughs> but you can't hug me, can you? Because you haven't got any arms. <laughs> I can give you a hug. <laughs> because I have got arms. And, and they're not just for rowing. <laughs> Please don't leave me. I love you. I'm, I'm glad it didn't come from an egg. <laughs> I mean, Jack, what was that like to perform coming in from a career in stand-up? And you were writing comedy as well at the time. Thank you. Fuck Jonathan Ross. <laughs> um, no, I, yeah, I'd never done anything like that before. And also, I think I'd never, and, until I did Fresh Meat, all I'd done is, yeah, sitcom and, and stand-up. And all I ever thought that I wanted was just to make people laugh. And I thought that's the only kind of aim that I have for anything that I do. And that was the first time I'd done anything where um, the response to it was m moving people in a different way. And it was genuinely the moment that I thought I, I, I would love to like properly be an actor and to do you know stuff that has a bit more depth and to tell stories and to do something more than just make jokes all the time and that was because of the experience of doing fresh meat and being able to do something uh with the quality of writing that we had um in that first series and to be able to do and play a character that had an arc and went on a journey like that and uh had some kind of you know depth and humanity to him as well was amazing i mean they managed to you know, show more humanity with JP in that episode than I'd ever been able to show, like, humanity in myself on stage in, like, <laughs> yeah. the four or five years that I'd ever done it. So I was like, it was, it was the most satisfying thing ever to be able to, to do it. And uh, what, the only thing I do remember about that scene very vividly is that that horse really did not want to be lying down. <laughs> <laughs> you see it twitch a couple of times. Yeah. And whilst I was genuinely in the moment and really feeling those emotions, I, I was also quite terrified that the horse was going to stand up at any point and kick one of my cast members. So <laughs> there was genuine fear and trepidation as well. Yeah. I think that's also where the nights out that we're talking about really helped us because I don't think the six of us realised that when we were shooting, there were some of us who were from a drama background who were intimidated by the comedy and then there were some of us who were from a comedy background who were intimidated mm. by the drama. and we really were part of a comedy drama, one of the purest comedy dramas, I think, um, that there's been on, on terrestrial TV. And, and so it was a really interesting moment when we started sort of breaking down mm. the barriers of <laughs> who was like yeah. secretly afraid yeah. in scenes, because I walked away from that scene going, oh, fucking hell, he can do drama. You know, or, um, or, or uh, what was the, one of the biggest scenes that we did was it VOD's overdose? I can't remember. We yeah. all had to straddle the comedy drama like at all times. Yeah. And that was a really instructive moment for all of us yeah. as performers because we all ended up kind of owning whatever genre yeah. that we didn't feel like we were in possession of before. And that was really a turning point. I think we were so spoilt by the dialogue. Like, I just, it's just so amazing to be able to ha ha tread that line and to have it written like that because that's just such a, it's so sort of tricky, but also um, it's just, yeah, it's such a treat. It was just such good, such good writing. It's just so good to perform, I think. And like, watch it, we've all been saying, we've been watching it about the last couple of days and just being a bit like, oh, it's so good. It's like, yeah, yeah. It's so annoying as well, because we were so spoiled when we yeah, got those yeah. scripts and the first time we read them and they were so brilliant and you take it for granted at the yeah. time. And it just fucks the rest of your career. You <laughs> never get a script that's as good as the scripts that we got on Fresh Meat. You never get that same excitement again. So thanks for that. <laughs> so the first season wrapped, it aired. Channel 4 commissioned a second season. I feel like while the first was still on air, if not very shortly after. But when for you did you start to realise that the show was a success with audiences? When did you start to realise that you were you know, your characters were really reaching out and touching people. I remember um, one day in particular where, uh, prior to Fresh Meat, I'd, I'd done a show in Scotland 
but had done um, had done quite well, but hadn't really reached down south. But I was living in London, and uh, a man looked at me one day on the tube and just nodded at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember it so clearly, thinking, "What? What? Why did he do that? You know, there's all kinds of oddness that happened." And then I was like. All right, that's him doing a little little Howard nod, and I remember that, and that was after the first series, and I thought, wow, in London, someone's watching this show and has recognised me from that. So I, that was my tiny moment on the tube, and I thought, right, this is really, this is something is happening here. But even after the first, I think it takes a bit of time, but that, I'll always remember that little moment for me. But I don't know about anyone else. I got asked to go and give a speech at Stowe by the headmaster. <laughs> At the Did fictional school that I attended. Yeah. Did you? Yeah, he said, We love the show. Would you come and give out some prizes and do a oh, speech right. at Speech Day? I was like, Have you watched the show? The character is horrendous. <laughs> I actually also had a guy who, in a nightclub um, on the King's Road, which I just happened to be in. <laughs> I'm not like that character, I, I am acting. This guy came up to me, he was wearing like a pink Ralph Lauren shirt, like, but like, I think maybe even, like, just one button was done up, like the whole chest was out, and he had a bottle of Bollinger in one hand, very sweaty, big, red-faced schweff, and he came up to me and prodded a finger at me, and he went, you give Stowe a very bad name. <laughs> You'd already been in a massive hit, was, which was yeah. the Inbetweeners, which I hadn't seen, so I didn't have a TV. <laughs> oh my God! So yeah, I, I mean, I suppose, I suppose, yeah, I mean, I suppose to me it was the, the, the it, there, there's a. Is there a difference in fan? Yeah. But these erudite intellectuals. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Woke. <laughs> uh, do you remember Tony Gardner? Tony Gardner actually emailed us. Oh yeah. Tony Gardner, yeah. who plays Tony Shales, whatever he is. But um, I, Tony, um, <laughs> I, when the show had, w was airing, I was so convinced that I was going to be the weakest link of this amazing. Sixem, and so I finished filming and decided to flee to Cuba. <laughs> um, I mean, this country so is no internet, <laughs> so that I could be so far away from the release that not even a um, you know an alert would pop up on my phone because I would have no internet. And um, I remember needing to go to an internet, ca well, going to a hotel lobby in Cuba because I really needed internet to contact my parents. Something had gone wrong. Can't remember what happened. Anyway, not serious. <laughs> and, um, and I'd gone and paid for some internet in this hotel and was scrolling through my hotmail and there was an email after the first episode had aired from Tony Gardner to all of us saying, watch the first episode, I hope you're all ready for your lives to change. And I was just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then got back to London and um, a bit like you, Greg, was suddenly noticing people staring at me on public transport or, you know, in For bookshops. future reference, you, you, have you heard of aeroplane mode? <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't have to go all the way to Cuba. I wanted to! <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to get any messages. Just exile myself. myself. <laughs> I must go to Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> I've had letting my messages right now. <laughs> also, my hair hadn't grown back, so I was, like, pulling beanies over oh. Oh. I remember Kim and I watched The Inbetweeners at night during the first series. Yeah, we didn't of tell Meat. Joe this. You know that? I don't know if you know that. Anyway, we yeah, go we back to Yeah, we used to Kim's... watch you in the night. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I Obsessed. remember, I remember having this really like really sweet conversation with Kim. Where she was like, "Well, night then," and I was like, "Night then." And then she went, "Like, do you think? Do you think maybe people will know us from this?" And I was like. I don't know, Kim, I don't know. <laughs> We're just going to have to wait and see. And like the thought of it was just so completely, I mean, it's still bonkers, but it, at the time I remember being like, I wonder what it's going to be like. Actually, for me, it really wasn't very different between a series one and two. <laughs> I don't know, it was extensions, maybe it's the extensions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to open up to audience questions very shortly, but I mean, something I would like to know, which I, I asked Sam and Jesse, is, is again, a storyline or a scene or a moment or even a line of dialogue that really you love or you're really proud of as a performer or that will just stick with you from when you did it. Um, so if I could, if I could start with you. Oh, um, 
There are so many brilliantly written lines in the show, and so I'm going to pick one that is um, quite simple, um, but the sentiment behind it w at the time felt very, very um, strong and very meaningful. <laughs> um, because I, I, I was genuinely doubting so much all the time whether I was doing something that was um, uh, truthful and proper and funny and dramatic and all the things that we've just talked about. And I think that comes from being a young actor. There might be some in the house tonight where you're just in that overthinking mode. If anything, I'm sort of more of a Josie underneath <laughs> than anything like a VOD. Just had this overthinking, overthinking thing happening. And um, there's a scene where I've, uh, after VOD has overdosed in, in season one, where Kingsley is trying to interview her secretly um, about what the overdose was like, because you're trying to get onto the, <laughs> yeah, onto the yeah, school yeah. paper. Yeah. And um, he's sort of asking me these surreptitious questions, and he's like, well, you know, what did you think when you vomited on that man whilst you were fucking him? <laughs> 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 oh, and he's tr basically trying to get Vod to sort of have a conscience. And, yeah. um, Again, what's so brilliant about the writing and the unapologe uh, unapologetic nature of the way Vaud was written is she just goes, what do I think? Well, I'm going to butcher it, I don't remember the line, but what do I think? She's like, well, I don't really think about things, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and that was such, a, an, <laughs> that was such an illuminating moment for me, yeah. Zowie, the performer, and for Vaud, because suddenly it was true. It was just supposed to be that mm. you weren't supposed to overthink these yeah. characters. You were supposed to be led yeah, from totally. whatever depraved instinct yeah. they had mm. and, and that you had. And um, so it, it not the most interesting line, but definitely one of the most transformative yeah, scenes and, and moments. And shout how about yourself? Um, oh, God. Um, can I choose someone else's? No, I've got to choose. Because the thing that keeps coming back to me is when is when Bod is pretending that Howard is her boyfriend. Oh. And she says, I'm fucking crazy about you, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, it always comes back to me. I, and Ow. watching them trying to get that take. We couldn't get through that. That was so <laughs> funny. <laughs> David, I, think was with David. I think we reached take 15, and suddenly the atmosphere on the set changed. And it was like, you need to say this line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, you were children in church being told to be quiet, and uh, I was like, that, I will never forget <laughs> that forget day. It. so funny. What was it? I'm so fucking scared. serious about you. I'm fucking serious about you, that's I'm right. I'm fucking serious, serious about you. And you're serious about me. Yeah, that's my favourite. Um, <laughs> the moment that sticks to me the most is not technically a line from the show, but it, it springs to mind because we spoke earlier about the first meet that we had on the first read through and everyone was very tentative and very nervous and I always remember the final read through of the final series <laughs> and it was testament to how much by that point we'd become very very close intimate and it was by that point literally like we were a family and there was a scene in it and everyone was at this table read there was you know directors producers all of the writers including all of the people from channel four as well Piers Wenger who was the new head of um, drama at, at Channel 4, so it's quite a high stakes environment. And there's someone there reading out the stage directions, and they read out JP and um, Josie are uh, having sex. And Kimberly goes, Oh, for fuck's sake! Why? Why? Why are you going to do that? And I'm sat there like, Okay, great, yeah. <laughs> Right, so my massive defense, right? <laughs> Every time we had to do anything, he was horrendous. No, don't say that! No. Don't say <laughs> that! There was a scene, I can't really remember, but we're You're in You're gonna the... have to give no. that a little bit more. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> like, there was all the sex scene stuff, obviously, and he'd pretend he had a dildo, and he'd pretend... <gasps> no! <laughs> no! I remember that! <laughs> Are you John Barrow me? No, sorry, I'm not. Uh, there was a scene, like, I think, I can't remember when it was, but we're in the hallway of the house, and it's actually quite a, a sweet moment, and usually between us, and we have a little kiss, <laughs> yeah. and so it was meaningful, and so without the crew seeing, Jack licked the rim of a bin. I pretend. <laughs> he, he, like, rimmed the bin. <laughs> <laughs> and then, 
And then they were like, okay, great, everyone ready? Okay, turn, nice and quiet on set, everyone, because it's, you know, turning like that. And he was just, like, coming at me. <laughs> <laughs> and I literally, like, just lay back and think of whales. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, like, so, um, so in my, I, I stand by it. Because it was like, oh, for fuck's sake. You said sake. it was like having sex with your little brother by the end. <laughs> We were like brother and sister by the end. Yeah, obviously that's why. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just because at that point, yeah, it was. We were we so were we were so weirdly like sibling close, mm. and it was like, oh, God. anytime any of us had to then do something romantic, actually weirdly, it was just it, it was more awkward than it was at the beginning. <laughs> when we didn't know each other, it was fine. <laughs> when we were just strangers. <laughs> just strangers. So, yeah, I stand by it. So a different scene for you than Kimberly as one that you'll take away, or was the bin kiss the one that, that really... It's by the bin liquor. Yeah. I had a lot of hump days. Like, a lot of hump. I used to go into my trailer in the morning and there'd be like just a dressing gown hanging up and you'd be like, oh, hump day. Um, jo- Josie's making some bad choices today. Um, I... I think that I got to do so many amazing things as Josie, and I got to do so many we- weird things. Because um, I, I, Zowie and Charlotte always had the most incredible hair and makeup, and then I'd go in and they'd be like, just a bit of lip balm and mascara for you today. <laughs> like, okay. So whenever I got to be like Jobo, or whenever she like wet <laughs> mental, like whenever she like was gonna be like a, a kind of like a tart or whatever it was, we just went mint, like crimpers came out and it was just oh, yeah. like, we went nuts because we never really got to go nuts. And I got to do so many mad, <laughs> funny things with her. But I think the, the moment that I most remember, because I'm I was, I'd always sort of despaired of her slightly as like a sort of younger sister who'd gone off the rails. And then in the last series, um, I think we were all there, but it was just between me and Joe. We were kind of, everyone was in the scene, but it kind of honed in on me and Joe on the couch. And she, uh, Josie did the right thing. And it was such a big moment for me because she'd made so many mistakes and taken the easy way out or shame someone else and suddenly she sort of she did the right thing and she sort of she let Kingsley go because it was the it was the best thing for him and I always that really yeah. stayed with me because I knew then that Josie would be all right yeah, yeah. we've got a little bit of that clip but I'm going to come to that after we've, oh. we've asked Greg and, and Joe as well but yeah that's it that's what I mean uh, Howard uh, just spoil start to finish like <laughs> spoil start to finish in terms of <laughs> moments I got in the writing, the dialogue I got. So um, I'm actually I'm actually going to go a bit soppy here because um, it's one of the episodes I watched the other week was uh, JP's dad's funeral when you come back and mm. you think you're on your own and we've all dressed up to come to the funeral. Mm. And uh, for me on a kind of personal and a group level, mm. uh, I remember thinking, oh my goodness me, that is so... It just takes me back to that moment. I always remember that and it's it's not to be too soppy, but I think it's a tribute to all the writing and all of the work we all did together. That reminds me, that moment will always stay when we stand back and you come back in and Howard's in this polyester fire hazard nightmare. (laughs) Everyone's everyone's made the effort. And I think, again, it goes back to that very, very difficult mix of pathos and comedy. And in that show, I think that's what I'll be most proud of. And that moment kind of signifies that to me. So I'm going with that. Lovely. And Joe, finally. Mm. I think our kiss. Which one? Our kiss. kiss. Yeah, it was um, uh, was my kiss with uh, with Jack. um, (laughs) I call it uh, my fee um, (laughs) uh, for that series. My my stipulation. Um, I was just there was a bit that I liked where Kingsley had two girlfriends for a bit, um, (laughs) and then Heather dumps him. But he has to pretend to be sad, but actually he's really happy. <laughs> but I like that because it was this kind of complexity that you got, you tended to get in the writing of the show. And it was quite challenging because I'm just so fucking stupid and quite linear. And like, I was like, what is it? So, like, <laughs> so he thinks, what does he think? He think like, there's more than one. Like, I, don't, I can't follow Inception, for example. Right? <laughs> <laughs> one layer. <laughs> <laughs> but she is not my girlfriend but so I was I was quite pleased that I followed I, I could follow it <laughs> um, but yeah that was fun because I, I it was but it was it was kind of you got that sort of writing this kind of like it was clever you know 
which I hadn't had before. Uh, clever in a, a different way but um, it's, <laughs> but, um but yeah I just that was there was something about that uh, that scene that I am um, uh, somehow summed up this this him being in this pickle and it, and it being this because although he's ostensibly quite a decent character he is also quite he's capable of duplicity and and he's capable of well, he's still weak in the way that you know you are kind of weak when you're young and 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 um he's not really doing the right thing and um yeah that yeah i suppose that that was that was one that i liked anyway yeah, that's yeah. didn't you fate give josie your virginity again yeah he like, loses his virginity twice and he, he pretends lost <laughs> it once but then he um but she's uh, made yeah. a big deal so she's made a big deal out of it so yeah he does so it he's again. already lost it <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's sweet yeah. <laughs> So, you didn't do anything with Sam? No. I mean, I could have done, obviously, um, but then I just thought, is it worth it? No, it's not worth it. And you didn't do anything with Noah? With Noah? God, no. That was never going to happen. Great, so everything's fine. We're all fine. We can just go back to normal. Yeah. Except everything's not fine. Is it? Well, maybe we just need to do something to keep things fresh. We could have a threesome or get into open air sex. That's not the answer. Or we could try chastity. The concept, I mean, not chastity from your course. Kingsley, listen to yourself. Marriage, followed by marriage counselling. We could move to New Zealand and start a farm. Or we could do that thing from Germany where one of you eats a bit of the other one. Yeah, that well known way of saving a relationship by eating your way out of trouble. I love you. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make this work. I will shave off my soul patch. I will stop eating penne or carry on eating penne, whichever it is you want me to do. And I will listen to Mumford and Sons with you. And I will not make sarcastic remarks. And I will not dance ironically. And I will do everything you want. And I will make you happy. And we will buy a house overlooking the Gower Peninsula. And we'll have two kids. And we'll grow old together. And we'll sit in the sun in our garden. And we'll hold hands till we're 90. And we'll be in love. And we'll be happy. I just think, I th well, generally, like, the, the kind of, th I think, for each character throughout and for all of us is that just bullshit. The, the, mm -hmm. Just the, the pretending to be, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, but really you're dying inside. And, and then five years later, you're like, why did I do that? I should have just been myself, you know. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that always. Yeah, it's the affectation, isn't it, of university? Yeah. Like, it's funny, you, you, you somehow think you're really old. And, like, when you graduate, <laughs> they dress you up as an old person. <laughs> <laughs> you're, like, oh, you're, like, almost about to put in a coffin. You're, like, you're, 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 you're none. You're dressed yeah. for death. Yeah. Gowns and stuff that no one's ever worn. <laughs> uh, it's kind of, oh, that's it, really. And, um, and you're not old, you're really, really young. But yeah. because everything's front loaded in terms of education, you're like, it's not even school, it's after, it's even older than that. Like, you're kind of <laughs> like, you think you're. So, yeah, I think that, that whole sense of like, I mean, I think even like now I sort of start, I'm vaguely, I'm 38 now, I've started vaguely thinking, oh, I guess now I can get a sense of like, objectively what I'm like and, <laughs> uh, uh, but, but yeah that that um, it, it really does capture that I mean again I don't know I swear to god there was a document written yeah there was definitely yeah it was there yeah yeah, and, yeah. And, and it did have a lot of it was about people thinking that pretending to be one thing and, and, and actually they are there's something else um, and and I think that it's, it's obvious that the teenagers are like that, but it's, it's less obvious, I think, that, that the students are still like that. And, and also, a kind of, you're not allowed to show weakness in quite the same way when you're a student. You have to be very serious mm. and very... And you're supposed to be intelligent, yeah. I suppose. You're, you're studying. You're supposed to like, know about stuff. So, like... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to try incredibly hard and look like you don't care mm. at yeah. the same time, mm. which yeah. even just performing yeah. that is exhausting. Yeah, yeah. Because it's... It's everything and nothing at the same time. Yeah, it's that sense of like, what what am I actually supposed to be doing here? Yeah. Well, like, <laughs> yeah. you, you, like, it's, it's not just you're supposed to work hard, weirdly, is it? Well, you, like, it's not, you think it, but it's not that. But then it's also like, don't get 
thrown out. But like it's something like getting the like do well without really trying. And, yeah. And, um, so so basically, all of you need all of all of it yeah. is channeled. It is effectively channeled through this. I think. Yeah. Oh, do you know a qu- riffing on your question? And not to take over the interview, but um, <laughs> it, I, I often think about the character that I actually was at uni versus the character that I've played in the mm. show. And whenever I watch it back, I really do chime quite a lot, weirdly. Actually, now that I see him, quite Kingsley chimes. Yeah. But I was quite... Josie, I was always trying to like keep the relationships that I had at home going because that was the most important thing. I wasn't ever supposed to kind of lose myself to the chaos of, um, you know, the next phase of adulthood and I was always organising parties and then counting how many boys there were to girls and then feeling it was a failure if there wasn't enough of a mixture of the two. So I, I was more a Josie at uni and I wish I had been more of a VOD. Um, what about you? Yeah, or do I wish I'd been VOD? I don't know. Yes. Which way? Every day of my life. Which way are you more life? at uni Oh, I think life? Yeah, yeah, I think probably much more Josie. Because I think the thing that I shared with Oregon was definitely, and I, I mean, it's hard to share t- in your 30s anyway, is that feeling of, it's exactly that, pretending that you know what you're doing and looking relaxed whilst doing it, even though you're panicking. Um, but I think that the thing I always admired about Oregon was her, like, she actually, despite being extremely insecure, manifested that with, like, such bolshy confidence, like, continuously writing <laughs> plays and joining, like, political movements and, like, <laughs> running as president and, and then styling that out much in the way that people do these days, style things out. And, like, and I just think she had this, like, she didn't, what I would have did was retire, whereas what she did was go, I'm not secure, let's go! And I'd be like, I really admire that and I kind of wish I'd had more of that. We had the same core, different actions. <laughs> well, just to go from what I was just talking, I think um, I, there's a chance Oregon would be in the current government. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the writers said that to me. I can't remember who it was. Yeah, send me, a, right, send me yeah, an article of someone company. being could be this. Yeah, you would have given that press conference. Like yeah. that would have. Like, <laughs> that's literally Oregon. Hundred percent Oregon. Oregon. Yeah. Although, although that's she might it. have been a bit more. You know, she's quite a rule. She follows rules, so maybe. I think JP would have been the one. I think you would have been the one to say, "Bring your own wine." JP would have been there in front of Laura Kunzberg going, it was not the apocalypse, it was a work event. <laughs> I do you know, I find it I find it so hard to answer this question because uh, Vod is someone who is so in the moment and never really cared about um, the future uh, and was quite nihilistic in that way. Um, so I find it hard, but I have probably said before that I think that as the internet really started to pick up <laughs> some traction, she would have accidentally invented like Uber Eats and <laughs> just be really rich and comfortable oh, yeah, so. and um, yeah, just making apps. But it's, it's it's funny though about about like I think the the kind of upside downness of of comedy because often you get these kind of characters who are a bit more naive and speak their mind a bit more. And, and in an odd way, as I grow older, I think those are the characters who are better adjusted. Like, they're less pretending. And in Howard, sort of, Howard and Vod, who are kind of like the weird ones, um, <laughs> like, actually, in some ways, they are both, they're, they're better adjusted and they, they are better ready for, like, the world. It's the other ones, the ones who seem like more kind of yeah. up, up with, like, yeah what they're supposed to yeah. think and like what they're supposed to read. I always imagine, absolutely, I always imagine Howard, like, his, his aspirations never really changed and once he got into yeah. National Geographic, <laughs> yeah. he turned down every promotion opportunity yeah. open to him yeah. because he knows he's who quite, he, is, right? he knows who he is, he doesn't, yeah. he doesn't want responsibility. So I kind of imagine Howard really quite, quite happy and, and yeah. hopefully him and uh, Sabine um, <laughs> uh, caught up again in later life. <laughs> you know, once, once, once Howard was on for the serious challenge of Sabine, uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd hope that in National Geographic, Howard was, was working very much on a manual basis as well. And and doing that quite happily, but yeah, yeah. as you see, he's like yeah. he doesn't he doesn't have the the 
the bullshit aspiration really. I think he came out and maybe settled down, but he's also capable of moments of action like genuine quality as well. Like there's a bit where doesn't he? He takes the blame for somebody who's made like, an accident being filmed wanking or yeah. something and houses it with me. That's how we're all over. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's an extraordinary thing to do, and actually, it's it's um. Uh, for the, the sort of Kingsley and Oregon characters who kind of like kind of know what they should do but sort of aren't doing it and, and, and um, it, it, it's not something that they would do no. and um, no absolutely not but it's a nice kind of kickback to d- the dynamic between you know how, who would have yeah. thought Howard and JP ended up but kind of yeah. you know these two yeah. absolutely polar opposites but Howard's got levels of empathy but again going the scripts and the characters that underneath yeah. all this absolute failings and whatever they go on to do there's still enough empathy in them that you, you kind of go back to it. But I think National Geographic for me in the maps department. <laughs> I think Josie would be married with a couple of kids, but still sleeping with the Prime Minister. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Basically, oh, Martin McCutcheon in love action. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Yeah, but darker. <laughs> so, yeah. Have we, who have we not so, done? I think with you. Is it just me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, Where would he be? Writing. Think, yeah. Music. Writing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> poet. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose Kings is a, you know, he's probably a bit like me in some. He'd be, he'd be in fresh meat. I don't know. He'd have sort of slipped into acting and then suddenly he's 38 and he's realised he's got to do it for the rest of his life. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, <geez>. Still. <laughs> and I thought he might. I, 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 I also thought Kingsley might be like. Um, I don't know, like a, probably something like a teacher or a nurse or something kind of like with people. He's not. A, he's a nice person, right? He's so. He's got a. He's got a. Basically, got a moral compass and he's essentially quite all right with people so he'd be something you know he'd be, be something along those lines something <laughs> something, de- something decent and boring i suppose like something <laughs> something undervalued <laughs>
Vod's uh, um, overdose yeah. in the hospital was shot the day after my birthday. <laughs> yeah. um, and that was probably you didn't have the any most makeup. hungover I've ever been. To the point where, because also, you know, this is one of our first massive nights out together as well. So you are genuinely trying as hard as the characters to sort of <laughs> be the, you know, the coolest person you can be. And so um, I didn't need any makeup because I looked like I was recovering from an overdose. <laughs> and we were filming in a real life hospital and everyone was doing so well because it's the scene where they were all sort of stood around my hospital bed and I was like, God, everyone's doing so well. I'm like sweating and I can smell the wine coming out of my pores. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the, the, the main sort of ensemble scene finished and everyone disappeared and I was helped out of the hospital bed by a lovely assistant and then was walking through the hospital corridor and someone who was genuinely unwell in the hospital went, God, do you think she's all right? <laughs> <laughs> <It's> terminal! <laughs>it was it was such a significant thing that when we've just finished filming like that was so huge and so strange doing this and talking about it like i feel a proper yearning for mm. like for that time yeah. Yeah. it's a really kind of strong feeling it's such a specific thing i think i, I personally it sounds like everyone felt doing this show it is really it was really special i still feel quite choked up thinking about like yeah. how it's just sort of done and it is a pleasure that we can most people's you know jobs if you finish it you can't go and watch hours of it <laughs> and pretend that you're the person again. <laughs> I don't do that. Um, but it's like, it was, yeah, really gut, really gut-wrenching, actually. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't like, oh, great, thank God it's done. I'm just so sick of this. It was just yeah. like, we, I think we left the next morning together, maybe, at the train station. I think station. one of the oldest oh, things no, as well is we, we shot That's the final great. scene in advance, didn't we? Yeah. So it kind of gave us a precursor to how emotionally I think we were going to feel as we were sat mm -hmm. up and I don't know if we're going to see that clip or not but um, I remember we were all sitting there that day going whoa hold on a minute here yeah, that's hold on a minute yeah. it, was like, it was like leaving uni which is something that so many people can understand and if you haven't been to uni it's like leaving summer camp or something where you bonded with a community that as Kimberly said you never yeah. ever expected to become meaningful and um, transformative in your life. I'm going to start crying. Um, <laughs> and so I'm so sorry if we've ever come across smug at all this <laughs> evening and yeah. laughing at our own bits and talking too long and crossing over each other talking, but it really was the most uh, genuine acting experience that I've had on, on screen ever. And it did remind me of leaving uni because I felt when we walked away from that final scene and away from Manchester and away from this experience that I, I knew I would never meet that self again. Definitely. And that's how I felt when I graduated. I yeah. was like, goodbye, that person. For my interview, I, I asked a scene, and a lot of you say this scene is one of your favourites. So we're going to go to the final uh, moments of you all together in Fresh Meat. Maybe just duck down. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to show that to you now. But I do think that we should give a long-distance relationship a try. Because... They often work out, right, guys? Yeah. 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 Like these days. Yeah. You know, I think I'm finally beginning to accept you for who you really are. Good. Because I've decided I'm not a cartoonist. I'm going to become an estate agent and work for Foxtons. And if I'm really lucky, get one of those cool minis. Good. <clears throat> Great interesting you told me to follow my dream and i am yes i mean i did think that your dream might be to be an artist but nope brum brum beep beep percentage of the purchase price please what about you kings oh well my internship's unpaid so i'm gonna be living back with my lovely inescapable mum don't be silly now sack you can come live with me rent free <laughs> how'd you feel with that kingsley living with an estate agent in Chelsea. <laughs> an estate agent who is your ex-girlfriend's current boyfriend. The thing is, that is actually too good an offer to refuse, so yes, thank you. I would love that. Awesome. And then when Joe's comes down to stay, it'll be just like old times, eh? Yeah.
if I could, I would keep us talking for hours more, but that is sadly all the time we have. I want to thank you and everybody in the audience that worked on the show for coming out here today and celebrating this huge, beautiful, wonderful show. Um, can we have a massive round of applause for everybody? <laughs> Final, final scene where JC is walking around. I'm so sorry, Kimberly. It's going to be the final, <laughs> final so scene. You're killing me here. I'm like, <laughs> like my deathbed. And this is it. Thing is out now, so thank you. If you want to keep clapping, um, I welcome it. Because this is going to be <laughs> Thank you. Just a second. 